Welcome to this A-level chemistry multiple choice question walkthrough for the amount of substance topic. Have a go at the questions yourself first, then watch my video and listen to the explanations as to how to get to the right answer. In this question we're being asked what the empirical formula of a hydrocarbon is that contains 90% carbon by mass. Well, first of all, we need to remind ourselves that hydrocarbons are compounds that only contain hydrogen and carbon atoms. So if it's 90% carbon, it must be 10% hydrogen. Secondly, we need to think that this hydrocarbon is 90% carbon. So that means if we had 100 grams of this hydrocarbon, we would have 90 grams of carbon. And so that means that we can treat percentages as if they were masses. So then we need to set out the grid for an empirical formula, which has got the elements along the top, and then percentage or mass, then relative atomic mass, then moles, and then the ratio. So 90 for carbon, it's AR is 12, moles is mass over AR, so 7.5 moles. For hydrogen, 10 is the percent, AR is 1, so the moles is 10. To turn these moles into a mole ratio, we need to divide by the smallest number, and that is, of course, 7.5, and then we get a 1 to 1.333 ratio. We need to turn this into an integer ratio. Well, 0.333, that is a third, so that's 1 and a third. So we need to multiply this by 3, because that will get rid of the fraction, and everything will be whole numbers. And so then we get a ratio of 3 for carbon, four for hydrogen, so the ratio is C3H4, which means that C is the correct answer. Here we're told that a drink driving offence is committed if the blood alcohol level of a driver is over 80 milligrams of ethanol per 100 cm cubed of blood. We've been asked what this concentration is in moles per decimeter cubed of ethanol if there is precisely 80 milligrams of ethanol per 100 cm cubed of blood. So the first thing we need to do is convert 100 cm cubed into dm cubed using the fact that there are 1000 cm cubed and 1 dm cubed. So that means that there would be 800 milligrams in 1000 cm cubed of blood or in 1 dm cubed. Then we need to turn that into moles. Well, there's a pre-step there. We need to turn that 800 milligrams into grams. So that is 0 0.8 grams. And we're told that the MR of ethanol is 46, so we need to divide that 0 0.8 grams by 46, and we get 0 0.017 moles. And so therefore, we have got C, 0 0.017 moles per decimeter cubed of blood. This question is telling us that the heat released when one gram of ethanol undergoes complete combustion is 29.8 kilojoules. We've been asked what the heat energy released per molecule in joules is when ethanol undergoes complete combustion. So we have a few different options here. I'm going to show you what I think is the fastest way to do this. So first of all, the heat energy needs to be in joules. So let's start by turning that 29.8 kilojoules into joules. So 29,800. Next, we are burning one gram of ethanol. If we divide it by the MR of 46, which we've been given in the question, we know that this is 0 0.02174 moles of ethanol. And so then we need to work out what the energy in joules per mole is. So we take our 29,800 joules and we divide it by our 0 0.02174 moles and we get 1373000 joules per mole. And now a mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules of ethanol, and so therefore we know that we would release 1373000 joules per 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules. We've been asked what the energy is per molecule, so we need to divide this amount of energy by Avogadro's number. When we do that, we get 2.27997 times 10 to the minus 18 joules per molecule, which matches A as the correct answer once we round that to three significant figures. Here we've got a gaseous reaction between nitrogen and fluorine making nitrogen fluoride. And we're told that we're starting with 30 cm cubed of nitrogen and 60 cm cubed of fluorine. 
and we're being asked what the volume of the gas mixture will be after the reaction, given it's a constant temperature and pressure. Now that means that we're allowed to assume that this all behaves ideally, and the significance of that is that one mole of any gas will occupy the same volume as one mole of any other gas. And so in other words, we can treat volumes and moles and their ratios as being the same thing. So when we look at the chemical equation, we can see that half a mole of nitrogen reacts with one and a half moles of fluorine. That looks complicated, but essentially what that means is the moles of fluorine is three times bigger than the moles of nitrogen. And so if we've got 30 cm cubed of nitrogen, we would need 90 cm cubed of fluorine to react with that completely. We don't have 90 cm cubed of fluorine, we've only got 60 cm cubed, which means that fluorine is the limiting factor and it is all going to get used up. If we work backwards, that 60 cm cubed of fluorine would need three times less of the nitrogen to react with it. So if we divide that by three, we see that we need 20 cm cubed of nitrogen. What that means is that there will be 10 cm cubed of nitrogen left over once this reaction has finished. And that's the most common mistake for this question. The follow-up is, since we're using all of our 60 cm cubed of fluorine, and the fluorine to nitrogen fluoride ratio is one and a half to one, we will need two thirds of the volume of nitrogen fluoride as our amount of gas that has been produced. So we divide 60 by three, and then we multiply it by two, and we see that 40 cm cubed of nitrogen fluoride will be produced. When we combine that with the leftover 10 cm cubed of nitrogen, we can see that D is the correct answer because there will be 50 cm cubed of gas in the mixture. Here we're being asked which of the following reactions has the largest atom economy for the production of hydrogen. Now percentage atom economy can be calculated by dividing the total mass of useful products that are being made by the total mass of the reactants being used and multiplying that by 100. And so this question is luring you in to thinking that you need to calculate all of these percentage atom economies. You could, but that would take you far longer than the minute and a bit per question. What I recommend you doing is looking at these equations, spotting the fact actually that three of them produce the same quantity of target molecule, so that's A, B and D, they all produce one molecule of hydrogen, so we can cut a corner here by looking at the amount of waste product produced, because if something produces a greater mass of waste product, then it's got a lower percentage atom economy by definition. So if we take a look at A, the waste product is carbon monoxide. That's got an MR of 28. B produces zinc chloride, which we can work out. It's got an MR of 136.4, but we don't really need to do that. We can just inspect it and say, well, it's bigger than 28. So B is definitely wrong because it will have a lower atom economy. And then D, we're producing carbon dioxide as the waste product, which has an MR of 44, and we can quickly see that that will obviously be a bigger mass of waste than the carbon monoxide of 28. So we've ruled out B and D. Then we could, again, calculate percentage atom economy of these remaining two possible answers. But if we look at them both, they both have the same waste product, carbon monoxide, with an MR of 28. However, A only produces one molecule of hydrogen, C produces three molecules of hydrogen. So C is producing more hydrogen gas, our target molecule, but has the same mass of waste product that A has. So C has to have the largest atom economy because we're getting a greater percentage of useful product per total mass of reactant. So C is the right answer. Here we're being asked about a gas cylinder that contains five kilograms of propane. And we're being asked how many propane molecules are in the cylinder. Well, propane is an alkane with the general formula CnH2n plus two, which means that propane, which has got three carbons, will have eight hydrogens. When we work out the MR of that, it is 44. Five kilograms is 5,000 grams. And so now we've got our mass in grams, we can divide it by our MR, and that gets us 113.6 moles. 
Now, one mole of molecules of propane contains 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules. So therefore, 113.6 moles will have 113.6 times more molecules. So we need to multiply moles by the Avogadro's constant, and we get 6.84 times 10 to the 25. So C is the right answer. This question is asking us about a solution of acid. We've got 100 cm cubed of it. It's got a concentration of 2 moles per decimeter cubed. And we're asked what volume of water should be added to the sample to dilute its concentration to 1.5 moles per decimeter cubed. So first of all here, when you add water to the acid, it won't affect the moles of the acid that you've got. And so that means that the concentration times by the volume before you do the dilution will be equal to the concentration times the volume after the dilution. And in fact, we never even have to work out this value of moles. So we can substitute in the concentration of 2 and the volume of 100. And we can cut a corner here by not dividing it by 1,000 to turn it into dm cubed because we don't need to because we're not asked for a moles and this is only a one mark question. So all we've done so far is 2 multiplied by 100 is equal to the concentration afterwards, 1.5, times by its volume. When you rearrange that equation, you get the final volume is 133.3 cm cubed. And the question says, what volume are we adding? So we started with 100. We must therefore have added 33.3 cm cubed to bring it up to this volume. So B is the correct answer. In this question, we're being asked which of the following contains the most chloride ions. And so to unpick this question, I think we should first look at the formulae for these named compounds. So aluminium chloride is AlCl3, which means there will be three chloride ions per mole of aluminium chloride. Calcium chloride is CaCl2, so two chloride ions per mole. Hydrochloric acid is HCl, one chloride ion per mole, and sodium chloride NaCl, also one chloride ion per mole. What we need to do now then is work out the number of moles of each of these different substances and then multiply it by the number of chloride ions per mole and look for the biggest number because we want the one that contains the most chloride ions. However, we can cut a couple of corners here. First of all, moles is equal to concentration times by volume. This should really be in dm cubed, but we've not been asked to calculate the moles and we want to be quick, so we can leave the volume in cm cubed because it's still going to give us an answer that is proportionate to the correct moles value. The second corner that we can cut is by looking at these standard form values. They are all times 10 to the minus 2. So we might as well not include them in our calculation each time. So what we can do, for instance, for A then is 15 multiplied by 3.4 multiplied by 3. And that gets us 153 as our value that's not the correct number of chloride ions or moles even, but it's proportionate to the correct answer. And so for the next one, 30 times 5.5 times by 2 gives us 330. So A is definitely wrong because it's a smaller number. C, 40 times by 2.3 times by 1 is 92, definitely wrong. And D, 45 times by 2.2 times by 1 is 99. Again, this is the wrong answer. So B has to be the correct answer because it's the biggest value. This is a titration method question where they're trying to find out the sulfuric acid concentration in a sample of battery acid. First, they get a 10 cm cubed sample of the acid, put it into a volumetric flask, then make that volume up to 250 cm cubed, and then after they've inverted to mix it, they take a 25 cm cubed sample out, put it into a conical flask, add some methyl orange indicator to it, that's necessary because the sulfuric acid is a strong acid, and then they do a titration with sodium hydroxide. It then says that the titration was carried out five times, but concordant results were not obtained. So that means that the results were a bit all over the place and there was no consistency. And then it says which suggestion would improve the accuracy of the titration. So A, rinse the conical flask with acid. Nope, that's definitely not. That's going to increase the moles of acid in the conical flask. Your titer volume would go up. 
rinse it with alkali. Well, that would have the opposite effect. There would be some alkali and acid in the conical flask at the start, so the tighter volume would go down. Rinse it with water. This would definitely be the right answer because the distilled water is not an acid or an alkali and it will make sure that there are no leftovers from the previous experiment. And D is a crazy answer because there will definitely be leftovers between one experiment and the next and you'll never know exactly how much alkali is left behind. This is a question about fermentation. We've been given the equation where glucose turns into ethanol and carbon dioxide. We're told that in an experiment, 268 grams of ethanol is produced. So this is the actual yield, 268 grams. And it's been made from 1.44 kg of glucose. And we've been asked what the percentage yield is. So the first thing that we need to do is work out the moles of glucose that are being used. So mass, 1.44 kg, needs to be turned into grams. Then we divide it by the MR, which we've been given, and we get 8 moles of glucose. The mole ratio from the equation is 1 glucose makes 2 ethanol. So 8 moles of glucose will make 16 moles of ethanol. So what mass will this have? Well, mass equals MR times moles. So 16 times by 46 that we've been given is 736 grams. Percentage yield is actual yield divided by theoretical yield multiplied by 100. So 268 divided by 736 multiplied by 100 gives us 36.4%. So B is the correct answer. Okay, I hope this has been useful. That's all for now. I'll see you soon.